Hello, folks. Hello. Welcome to another episode of uh, Comic Shop Talk, brought to you by Black Cat Comics in Rockin' Milpitas, your one-stop shop for all things superhero. I'm your host, Mark Causey. Today, my special guest is Steve Wyatt. Uh, don't even know uh, where to begin introducing you, Steve. Uh, let me go to my notes so I can write down what I actually said. Steve Wyatt, vintage comic dealer, uh, legendary local convention organizer and promoter, San Diego Comic-Con vendor, artist, fan, friend, um, all those good things. I think I come back. There he is. Okay, now I think I have hey. it. How you doing, Steve? I'm doing great, Mark. How you doing? I'm very good, thanks. Welcome to the show. Uh, just so the folks at home know, obviously my executive producer, Fancy, is not here. So I'm sorry things are a little on the fly this week. Uh, I'm trying to be the master of all things. But I think we have it all set up now. I think we're uh, live and having a good time. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, Steve, we have so many things to talk about. You are, uh, by everyone's standard, a, uh, a local legend. You've been in the industry forever. Uh, you know everybody. Um, first of all, I always like to start with, tell the nice folks at home uh, who you are, what you do, what you sell, and where can they buy it? Well, as far as selling, uh, I've been selling vintage comics since I was uh, about 12. I started working in it when I was 11. Um, I don't really have a store. I do conventions. You know, San Jose Toy Show, WonderCon San Diego. But I do have an eBay store. It's under Moonball. Um, uh yeah so right now that's the best place when we get conventions back i'll be having so much stuff it's unbelievable because i've been buying like crazy and cleaning out the sheds and the stuff i've been finding in the sheds we were just talking about it a minute ago are just phenomenal but moonball um and we're starting a shopify thanks to your beautiful wife uh francie moonball comics <coughs> is the name it's up there. We just don't have anything on it yet. And I even, because of her, started an Instagram Moonball Comics. So hopefully within a week or two, it'll all be connected. It's um, just I'm not a computer guy figuring it out, you know. <laughs> we're all moving and shaking in this new crazy world. Um, I know I have been uh, a purveyor of your books for a long time. Uh, a lot of these books back here have uh, probably come from your stash or at one time or another. I know a lot of my books at home have come from your stash, uh, notably my Fantastic 452, my first Black Panther, uh, and, and lots of other fun things from you. Um, Okay, so, and again, I know we have a lot to talk about. We only have an hour, so, and you and I both like to talk, and we don't have Francie here to moderate, so I'm going to put us <laughs> both on a kind of, of lightning round. Um, All right. Because I have so many things that, that, that I know I want I know that you know, and I want you to share with, with all the people, and I want to get to as many things as possible. So uh, you go way, way back, and I'm not going to date you or make you feel old. That's that's in this. No, way. I am old. It's okay. That's it's a, okay. a badge of honor. Uh, take me back. Take us back. Uh, how you got into this is where my where I'm getting at. You you promote shows. Uh, you do East Bay Comic Con. You do South Bay Comic Con. You do Mouse Con. Uh, before that, you're the guy that brought us uh, South Bay or um, uh, Super Supercon Con. Valley Comic Con uh, was Big Wow, and, and everybody and around before it, Big Wow is Supercon, yeah, and Supercon and Hayward Con, all those things. Uh, you're you're just a master of all these things, and and I we could talk all day about how you do what you do because I'm still mystified after all these years, but. Take us back to the early years of comics. Take us back to, to why you wanted to do shows and how you got to be a guy who could do shows. Well, let's, let's go all the way back. Okay. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, I'm a kid. I'm reading comic books. We kind of talked about my origin of buying my first box of comics when I was five. Um, all I ever wanted to do, and especially it was Avengers 57. People ask, why do you love that comic book so much? Avengers 57 went from reading comics to, oh, my God, look at this art and this this story. It was one that transitioned me. That's why I love that book so much. Um, I wanted to be a comic book artist. That's all I ever wanted. I always just, all I ever wanted, I wanted, but I wanted to be an inker. And actually, when I met 
John B. Sema, I told him, I had dinner with him and I told him all I ever want to do is ink his Thor. And he's like, never going to happen. But the next day he brought me a Thor, slapped it down and said, now you can ink my Thor and walked away. Wow. Um, wow. But having said that, all I ever wanted to do was draw comics. Well, I got into selling comics because I started working at the AC flea market in Castro Valley, right where all the freeways can, can join right there in Castro Valley. Those didn't exist. That was the AC flea market right there on that property. I started working for a guy, Kerry Lawless, um, when I was 10 years old. And I worked for him, and then he sold it to John Clemens, who owned the Comic Zone, who sold it to a guy named Daryl. And I worked for them till it closed in 1984. So I worked that flea market. Um, well, I got into comics, selling comics, because I just got good at it. And... I bought Howard the Duck number one, 100 copies at 12 and a half cents each. The next year I did Bacon, Bacon 3 up in San Francisco. And uh, Frank Bruner was two tables away and Sybil Danny was next to us. I worked Friday and Saturday and I had Sunday off, but I got to hang around at the show. Um, so I brought my 100 copies and I asked Frank Bruner if I could sell them there because nobody had them. And at $10 each, and Frank was like, hey, I will help you sell them, but do not go under $10 each. And we sold 99 of the 100 wow. for $10 each. And all of a sudden, I've got $1,000 in my hand. I didn't have $1,000 in my life. I didn't have $100 in my life. Um, but now I'm sitting here with $1,000. Well, 990 I kept one copy, and he signed it to me. Um, and I spent $40 at the show, so I went home with $950, where my mom even called Carrie and said, did he really make this money? It's not that she just trusted me, but it was unheard of. My mom didn't have a thousand dollars, you know? Um, and he's like, yeah, he made the money. So um, I put it in a drawer, mom's drawer. And then the next summer we had a small show and this guy, Mark Blackney showed up and he had, uh, what was it, about 20 long, oh, no, it was two 12 foot tables those folding six foots that go to 12, two of those full of long boxes. And it was full of multiple copies of like Conan one, Conan two, Conan, but like two years of that new age of Marvel. So Iron Man one, Captain America 100, uh, you know, Iron Man Submariner one. Um, and then he had the, you know, all the, but it was like two solid years, mint copies. Well, we were talking and I wanted to buy a, a Conan one. They were $35. And he told me if I put a, a long box together, it was $100, but no more than five of any book. So I started at one end, ended at the other, and took five of every single book. I put four long boxes together. I was starting the second one. He's like, Steve, do you really have this kind of money? And I'm like, yeah. So I spent $400, but I did this so I could get the best one of each. Mm -hmm. Well, now all of a sudden I have five copies of each of all these good books. I'm a dealer. And then I started telling the kids at school, I will pay a nickel a comic book for anything you bring me, as long as it has a cover and it's not like shredded. Well, what happened was kids were bringing me their comics, but they were bringing me dad's comics and grandpa's comics. <laughs> and I remember I was getting stacks of Silver Age at a nickel each. I, I remember one week X-Men 94 had come out and it was a $30, 30-ish dollar book. I remember buying three of them in one week from three different people. Um, a teacher caught me buying comic books, took me to the principal's office. I talked to the principal and the teacher, and I'm like, look, I'm just being entrepreneur. -y. Well, I didn't use that word because I didn't know what it was back then. And the principal went, you know, good for you. Yeah. He asked me what I did with them and all. And he said, from now on, when you make these deals, you can store them in my during the day in my uh, office. So for the next four years, that's where I, when I buy them, I did that. So next thing you know, I'm selling comics. Well, I missed Bacon 5 because I had bought my $30 table, had to go to Bacon 5 that morning. My, it's in San Francisco. I live in Castro Valley. My mom's like, uh, I got just got called into work. I can't take you. So I missed it. And I said, well, I don't want to do this again. Now, mind you, I never wanted to sell comics. I just got good at it. So <laughs> I went through this. And a couple months later, and at this point, I knew Frank Sirocco and Brent Anderson and that local group. And I knew 
Um, Arthur Lake, who was Dagwood on the old Blondie TV shows, he lived here in town. So, and I knew him through somebody else. So I called them all up. We rented Centennial Hall and I put on the first, what we call the Supercon. The first Hayward show was Supercon. And this was 1979. I didn't want to put on a show. I just didn't want to miss another one. So annually, I would I started putting on the show. I was in ninth grade. It was 1979. Wow. Um, I didn't do it because I want to be a show promoter. I did it because I wanted to sell my books. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, I got good at it. So now I'm selling comics and all because I got good at it. Not be I never wanted to do it. I still only wanted to draw comics. It wasn't until I was 40 before I published my first book. And I've been published in Image, Viz, um, uh, Dark Horse, One Page in Marvel, um, Boom, a handful of other things. But as an artist, and I've self-published eight books, so I have done it. But I realize I'll never be able to do it. I mean, if Marvel called right now and said, we will give you X-Men, it still isn't as much money as I make now. So I couldn't do it for a living, you know. But I do it because I love it. I do it for me. I think it's absolutely awesome that all that starts in, in, in like ninth grade. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's really cool. And, and I, it speaks a lot to the accessibility of comics. And I think it's still just a little bit true um, as a vendor, as a retailer, as, as, and as an artist, as all kinds of things, even as a fan, one thing I've always said uh, is that if you're a comic fan, you're a fan of other things. Uh, you're a sports fan. Uh, you can't. You can go to a game and 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 they do the events where you can go down on the field and meet players and like that. They do stuff like that once in a while. Uh, but at Comic Con, you can meet all kinds of these guys and spend time with them and talk with them and and you know what I mean. Oh, there's, like I say, there's I, accessibility. There's a way to get into comics uh, that that I don't know that a ninth grader can do. Uh, and, yeah. and like I say, well, that particular year was was a life changer for me. Seventy nine, we put on the Fantasy Symposium in San Jose. Well, I ran the dealers room, and that's where I met Sergio and Vern Hogarth, and I became friends with some a lot of these people. I mean, Sergio and me are friends to this day. I mean, I'm not talking about I see him at a con and say hi. We call each other on the phone and talk. Um, <clears throat> there's a group called Caps in, in L.A., <clears throat> Comic Art Professional Society, and I was actually president for two years. Um, but so Fantasy Symposium is the show that I have geared every show that I've ever done towards. That was the perfect show. I saw my first Frazetta. I met Pete Craig Russell. Uh, Bern Hogarth critiqued my art. Um, I ran a dealer's room. Um, that was the first year I went to San Diego. But I went with Frank Sirocco and Ken Macklin and Leela Dowling and that group. Went, I went to San Diego with them. Met Barry Smith and Bernie Wrightson, who I stayed friends with. A lot of those guys. Um, I put on my first show that year. I mean, a lot changed that year for me. That was like my pivotal year of, wow, this is a great thing that I'm doing. You know, it's just my love for comics just... Like the atom bomb of it went off. Um, that's oh, that's so awesome. Uh, and then Michael, one of my guys, says great background story, which is which is one of the many reasons I wanted to have you on the show. And and that's that's totally one of the things I, I wanted everybody to know was was how you got started with all this. Uh, now let's flash forward many years, and and now mm -hmm. it's okay. It's not this year because this year is 2020 and and all of that. But let's say it's last year. It's 2019. Talk and, and hopefully it will be again, uh, if not this year, next year. <laughs> Talk a little bit about what goes into putting on East Bay Comic Con, South Bay Comic Con, Mouse Con. Uh, you are, and, and, and I'm going to totally gush for you so you don't have to say it yourself. You're one of the hardest working people in comics. I, I've been in this gig for a long time. Everybody does their thing. Everybody works hard. I work hard. Uh, but, but I know you, you work hard on so many levels. It, it requires a lot of money that you pony up, time that you put in, effort to put in. Uh, so, so give people a little bit of an idea uh, okay, the last show, the last East Bay Comic Con has just ended, right? Uh, what do you, how do you, how are you getting ready for the next one? Um, okay, the show ends, the books are done. Um, I've already booked the next year. 
first thing I do is start contacting guests. Um, there's one show I do called the Hollywood Collector Show in, in Burbank that, as I do as a fan, that's the one show I go, I would say I pay admission to get in, but I don't pay admission to any show anywhere. I know too many people. <laughs> but I go in and I meet celebrities. Um, there's so many people that I've met that I'm friends with, but we start networking. Um, so guests are step one. Dealers, and, and I'm not going to say this to offense to dealers, it's actually a compliment to me and the dealers. When East Bay Comic Con's done, I've already sold out 90% of the next show because mm -hmm. I give everyone a contract for the next one. I don't ask for them to pay up front, which most shows do. I want a, a minimum deposit per table. So if someone's got three tables, it's just so much per table, but it's still, you know, a hundred bucks is going to hold their table to the next show. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I've already sold the dealer's room. I've gotten to a point to where that part's easy. Um, the hardest two points is one guests. Because especially these days, there's so many shows, even though I've been doing mine for so many years, there's so many people trying to put on shows. But the guests, and, and honestly, it's the East Coast that's the worst. It's like if I want a Frank Cho, and Frank's my friend. I could call him up right now and say, Frank, but he was going to do East Bay Comic Con. But three different deadlines got in the way, and he's like, Steve, I, I can't do it. Okay, well, you can do the next one, right? Okay, I'm in. I don't know if it's going to happen at this point, but... Guests are the hardest part, and constantly getting the word out is the hardest part. I mean, the stores, luckily, 90% of them are behind me. When I go to you guys and I go, here's flyers, you're like, we're stuffing bags with them, Steve, because you're supporters. Most stores are, luckily. There are a few stores that go, well, what do I get out of it? Or why should I tell my – my? I have one store, and I'm not going to name names, who used – who's a big player in this world. And he used to put on a show and expected everybody to support him. But now he won't even put up flyers for MouseCon, which are no com – MouseCon is no competition for any store anywhere. It's my own creation because I'm a Disney fanatic, and which yes. I, I came up with the name before I even came up with the show. I was literally driving down the street, do-do-do, because that's how I drive, do-do-do. And the name MouseCon just popped in my head, and it was like – I called my wife right then. I'm like, hey, honey. Why aren't we doing this? And she's like, I don't know. You know so many animators and yeah. actors and stuff. So thus MouseCon was created. But um, getting stores, you know, he his philosophy is this one store owner. Well, what can you bring to a one day show that I can't bring to my store? And what I've tried to get him to get is one, the enthusiasm of a crowd mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that matters. Mm -hmm. um, the product, yes, he might have. 50 to 70 percent of that product in a store but he doesn't have a hundred percent three yes he can bring guests to do signing in his show in his store but not to the level that we do sure. the panels he can't have panels i can have john wesley ship you know the flash on a stage and everyone's like wow i can have mike royer talking about jack kirby um we had the last east bay it was the same day as Frazetta's 100th birthday. So we had Tim Vigil and Dan Brereton and a few other guys up on stage talking about their experiences with Frazetta, which I opened the panel, introduced them, and I never do that. But I started it by telling my 30-second story of when I got to meet Frank Frazetta, mm -hmm. so, um, which was just – he's – He's the Da Vinci of our world. And that's super true. Not only did I get to meet him and shake his hand, I had a conversation with him a half hour after I met him because I couldn't talk with him when I saw him because all my mind could say is, That's Frank Frazetta. That's Frank Frazetta. You're, 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 you're that guy. Frazetta. You're that guy. Yeah, in my head. Now I went over by Glenn Danzig's booth and I know Danzig. Um, he was at Danzig's booth. Danzig brought him in and I saw him, but I didn't think about it. And he turned around and he looked at me. He goes, can you talk now? And we both laughed and we had a good half hour conversation, but he was just a great guy. So um, hey, real quick, I had the same thing with Danzig. I was walking by a booth and uh, you know, Oh my God, that's uh, what was, he had a comic company back then. And, yeah. Um, uh, erotic. Erotic. Uh, and, yeah. and like I said, I walked by, that's Glenn Danzig. And I, I think I stood there like with this look on my face for a good three minutes and, and he, he was, you know, super cool, but. Yeah, well, I, I got to know him before he was I, – before I knew he was from the Misfits, 
he was just this cool guy. I did the Shrine show in L.A. for 20 plus years. It was a monthly show. And I would I lived in Sacramento at the time. So I get up at two in the morning, drive to L.A., set up at a show and drive home. Could not do that now. Um, but uh, Danzig was a, not just a customer of mine. We talked old 70s books together. He loves, we, we both love the same artists, the same everything. So we'd have long, he'd come and sit down behind my booth. And it wasn't until like the third time he did this that somebody told me who he was. I just did never put two and two together. And it's, it's like John from System of a Down is a real good friend of mine. But we became friends in this world at that Shrine show before I knew he was the drummer of System of a Down. Sure. So... Going back to to what you were saying about shops and shows and, and whatever, just so the folks at home uh, get my end of this. I support local shows. I support all kinds of shows. And I've been told by other people, little what you're saying, why do you send your customers somewhere to spend their money somewhere else and, and all these things? Here's why. All those things you just said, I, I totally, totally believe are true. Uh, one... Um, um uh, my phone's ringing uh sorry folks you're gonna have to leave a message because i'm live on the air uh <laughs> it you i love promoting your shows because you provide an atmosphere that i can't provide in my store all those things you said and what i feel is the most important i love the panels i love meeting the artists i love all those things i love interacting with all those people all that's great but the reason I support the shows and encourage fans to go is so they can meet other fans. Uh, when you come to my store on Wednesday, even when I'm super busy on Wednesday, you're still going to see the same 50 people. Uh, and that's great. And I love that all my people hang out and whatever. But when you go to conventions, you can meet other people, uh, not I, just the famous people, but you can meet other people that other, like the stuff you like and, and all that. And I think that's I moved to Bakersfield. 50, I moved to Bakersfield 15 years ago and we started Bakersfield Comic Con. There are two groups here now that are all friends. And then the people that run my, my, um, my social media and the people that run my um, costume contest all met because I brought Bakersfield Comic Con here. They were all individuals, now they're groups. Mm -hmm. There's a whole cosplay community that exists because I brought this show here, so I get it. And I used to own a comic store up in Sacramento, the comic shop, uh, our comic stop. Um, your one-stop comic shop. That was my low, my theme. Um, but I own a store, and the one thing I would tell stores is, you know, if you don't tell somebody about a show and they find out, well, why didn't you tell me? Yeah. You're, you're their source for this world. But yeah. if you tell them that, yeah, they might buy that comic book you have in the wall, wall right there from somebody else. They might even get it $2 cheaper. But they're still going to come back because you sent them there. They love you. Yeah. They're, you're part of their community. You're yeah. their information source, and they appreciate that. And that's what I've tried to tell stores. I tried to tell stores two things. One, that exactly what we just said. And two, every store owner should be at every local yeah. store because you need to be there and not worry about making 10 cents. You need to be there and say, hey, Frank, you like what we got here? Come check out the store. Yeah. And if you get – Five new customers in one year because of that. You just made more money than you ever would have made at that there. And, you know, you have a very good store. You guys have a great atmosphere there. And people know that and they come back to that. You know, if you're – there are a few stores in town that have come and gone. We've seen many stores come and go. But there's uh, – the ones that have stuck around, there's a reason for that. It's because the people are good people in most cases, you know. Um, the product is good. The prices are good. And the atmosphere is good. It's inviting. Yeah. And that's so important. And we all have to be one unit. My shows, your store, their collections that's all have to work in sync. Totally, totally agree with all that. I guess I should have mentioned a long time ago to the YouTube folks. I'm sorry you can't see, see Steve's handsome face. Uh, we'll post the whole thing later on the on the YouTube channel as well, so you can watch the whole recorded thing. Uh, I'm hoping that you're getting all the audio okay uh, and that you're not just staring at, at me staring. Uh, but no, that's super <laughs> I, and and to uh, 
to back up all those things, to support all those things by talking about a show you don't do. Uh, you and I both love the San Jose Super Toy Show. Uh, yeah. Joe puts on a good show. We have a great time doing it. Um, I, I sit up there as a vendor. You sit up as a vendor all the time. I sit up as vendor sometimes when I can. I go there as a fan uh, when I can. And I think it's so important. I love what Joe does, and it's it's what you're doing with, with your shows. And I, I think they're so important. What's always been important, going back to your Supercon, and, and, and like, as you say, you saw a need for a show, uh, and you filled it, because exactly what you said, it's all one community. Uh, yeah. Again, I can't be all things for all people here in my store. But between my store, your show, and the fans' own input, uh, between the three of us, we can all three have a great experience and have a lot of fun uh, in, in this world that we live in. And so, like I say, I think it's, it's important for me to be a great shop. It's important for you to have a great show. Uh, and yeah, well, my office. shows, I don't make a lot of money at my shows. That's what I used to put on, even when we put on Big Wow, our weekend admission was still only $25. You know, we didn't do it to make money. We brought in 150 guests, more shows than almost any other show in the country. That was an awesome experience. Um, but I don't do this to make money. I could raise my admission to $15 and get away with it, but I don't. We're still at 8 and 10 for most of our shows. Um, it's about the experience. Mm -hmm. It's about going and having fun. My goal is that you as a dealer walk out and go, I had fun. I made some money, but I had fun. The right. fans walk out and go, that's great. I'm coming back and I'm bringing Joe and his family with me. Yeah. yeah. And the guests walk out and go, man, Steve puts on a fun show. I'm going back next year. Yep. And that's, I, I, that's it. It's that simple. I, I do need to come home and pay my mortgage, Sure. but I'm not banking a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and that's two things I've, I've always said about this gig. Number one, none of us make any money. Uh, we're all here because we love it. Uh, that's just the truth If we it. didn't love it, we would not be here. That's, that's just the truth of it. Uh, I'm, I'm very honest about that. If, if you're really good at what you do, you pay your bills and you get to show up tomorrow. Uh, that's, uh, but second, uh, on a little more of a serious note, not really, uh, I've also said that. If it's fun, then the business takes care of itself. Uh, you know, like all this thing we're doing this week, we do our pre-Comic-Con, Comic-Con, uh, and then we do these different events and we do these things. Uh, like this show right here. I don't make any money off this show, uh, but it's fun. And my customers tune in and they get to watch, they get to hear a fun conversation, they get to ask some questions that I'll ask in just a second. If, if I make it fun, then, then they want to shop on my website, then they want to come to my store, right? Uh, exactly. I can't, I can't make you buy something, no matter how cool it is uh, or what a great price is. Uh, but, I, but if it's fun and if it's cool and if they're having a good time, uh, then the business takes care of itself. And, and again, that's what keeps us all here uh, is exactly what you're saying. It, At the end exactly of the day, it. I go home, I had a good time. You go home, you had a good time. Uh, Michael went home and he had a good time. Uh, you know, he's only out 20 bucks. We only made 20 bucks, but we all had a great day. Uh, and, and I like to say, I think that's, it's a big part of the fun. Um, okay. I got to get to a couple of the questions. Uh, okay. and, and Nicole asked, uh, one of the ones that, that I, uh, I was going to ask, well, I'll, I'll ask a different one a little later. So, you know, everybody, uh, you already mentioned Sergio Aragona is one of my favorite, favorite people in the you world. You would die for this phone. I would, I would die for that phone. Uh, I need that phone to book more special guests for my show. Uh, but, uh, so, so I'm going to ask you about Stan Lee later. Uh, okay. and like I said, I, I, I know, you know, everybody who's the guest that you were dying to have and that you booked. Who's, who's the, the guest that made Steve go, oh, my God, I can't believe I got that guy. Okay. When we sold Silicon Valley, Big Wad of Silicon Valley, they paid me for three years to be the manager. Um, the third year, I finally, after 15 years of trying, uh, let me go back just a second and say, I have literally met every single person I ever wanted to meet that was alive to meet. Obviously, I didn't meet, you know, Matt Baker or people like that because they were gone before. Or Walt Disney died the year before I was born. But I've been able to meet them all. I have two dreams that don't 
count because I'll never meet, you know, JK Rawlings is one of them. Um, but in my real world that I could meet, the last one was Michael Moorcock, who wrote the Elric series. Mm-hmm. So I invited him, I invited him, he'd never come. Well, I finally got him. And um he came to the Silicon Valley, and at first he was like, Really? And we had a couple panels for him. This wasn't his kind of thing. But then he got there and we really we promoted him well. And people were when he did sit down because he saw his table and he's like, well, I'm not just going to sit here. I want times. So this all happened like three days before. So we set he'll be signing from, you know, 12 to 2 on this day. And so we set times and he was surprised that the line went. It was all the way around the booths twice. Um, But him, he was my last one. Um, I love the Elric series. I have a sketchbook where artists do just Elric drawings. I have drawings on my walls of Elric. I finally got P. Craig Russell to do one. Um, I mean, I Elric's like my guy. Um, but Michael Moorcock was the last one. And then after the Saturday, I took him out to dinner. It was just me and his wife. Uh, or me and, and uh, my wife and him and his wife and the four of us at Original Joe's in San Jose. We walked over there. Uh, my wife is a very, very quiet person. You've met her. Um, she was sitting there for about 15 minutes and hadn't said anything but hello. And um, Michael's wife, Linda, just reached over, put her hands on Julie's hands and just went, is everything OK, dear? And next thing you know, they're in conversation and we're in conversation. And we didn't talk about the books and how we wrote them, how we created them. We talked about our horrible dads and our many, many cats and our stupid children and all that kind of stuff. Um, Pain solutions. Uh, We did not talk about Elric once. And then um, the Monday after the show, I had to give them some money, some some reimbursement money, uh, because I was take care of the guests. And I got them a check. And I met them for breakfast. So we also sat and had breakfast Monday. So I got two long meals of just talking and I've got his phone number. We've communicated a couple of times since. So everybody I've wanted to meet, they've got, you know, Al Williamson. Oh my God. I got to not just meet him. He gave me two pieces of art that he did for me. Michael Kaluta is a good friend of mine. Bernie was a good friend of mine. Jeff Jones. Um, I got to, to meet, uh, Von Baudet just once back in the 70s. It was like 74 in Berkeley just for a minute. But I mean, Jim Lee's a friend of mine. I uh, I mean, I could, I could just keep going. There, there, there's just, I've met everybody and it's been great. And I told I'll, you about Rosetta. I'll focus you, know. you uh, for just a sec. I'll, I'll cut to the chase while we're on this topic. I'll, I'll fish these stories out of you. Tell me a Jack Kirby story. Um, Jack, I knew well, Jack and Roz. Um, I met Jack because Jack, I met him for the first time at Baycon 2 um, in San Francisco. I was a kid. It was like, oh my God, um, he was with Stan Lee, um, who, you know, we were reading Spider-Man and Fantastic Four back then. So we never knew who they were. Um, and then older, I, I got to sit down a couple times in San Diego Con, back in the day, there was this dinner called the um, AACC, American Association of Comic Collectors. And they had a dinner, and it was kind of a, you know, had to wear a collared shirt, and you didn't show up with this on. And it was, you know, $40 for a dinner, which was a lot. And we had, I mean, we got every living EC person together one time. We got all these people, but Jack was always there and Stan was always there. So I got to sit and talk with them over and over again. And when Jack finally won his lawsuit, which had nothing to do with the characters that he created, everyone thinks, oh, you know, he created them. He needed, no, it was more, he just wanted his artwork back. He told me once, he's like, no, because he was always asked, well, what about these characters? Marvel's making so much money. He's like, they paid me to create them. I've already been paid for it. That was my job. So he didn't go back and go, Fantastic Four belongs to me. No, he created it for Marvel. That was really cool of him. And all those people that said differently, no, I heard it from Jack. But having said that, when he got his art back, Mike Thibodeau, um, Second Genesis, he's you know an artist himself. He inked for Kirby. He started selling Jack's art. Well, me and Mike are good friends, so I started selling Jack's art outside of California, I'd go to, you know, Motor City and, and Chicago Con and those things with 
with portfolios of Jack Kirby artwork. Oh. And then when it was done, I got to go back to Jack's house and deliver it. And then I never took a dime for doing it. I took artwork. So <laughs> what, you know, um, but, and then when Jack passed away, I did it twice for Roz, but then she passed away almost a year to the day afterwards, which was expected. They lived their whole life together. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, as you say, I, I know you knew everybody and, uh, and, and I knew you'd have a Kirby story. Uh, and I know you have lots of Stan Lee stories. Uh, talk about, if you don't mind, you booked Stan. Uh, a lot of us have a picture uh, of us with Stan Lee because you booked him that year uh, at, at Big Wow or at Silicon Valley, whichever year that right, was. We had them three times, actually. Um, I think it was the last time, maybe next to last time that I got my picture with him. Uh, but anyway, talk about like one of the later, one of the later times. Uh, what, it doesn't really matter what, what was it like to be around that guy? Uh, well, knows hey, the uh, here's, a, here's a fun story. It, it wasn't at a convention. You know, I helped Russ Heath for 25 years. Um, Russ was an amazing artist. Um, I mean, there was one time Russ, Steve, I need someone to take out my garbage. I need you over here. Mind you, Russ lived 100 miles away. He lived down in L.A. I'm like, tried to find someone. Okay, Russ. I drove 100 miles, emptied his garbage, and came back. But having said that, Russ and Stan were good friends. So, I mean, Russ was at Stan's wedding in 1946, you know. Um, so uh, I would take Russ to Stan's office to have lunch. And the last time we did that, now both of them were getting really old. This was kind of their goodbye meeting. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. they were both getting really old. Russ had his cancer. Um, and I got Russ in there. And Stan looks at me because it's like Stan's sitting right here. Russ is sitting right there. And Stan turns to me. He goes, I can't hear a thing. So I might have to have you say something. Well, Russ is deaf as anything, too. So these two old men are talking to each other. Russ would say something to Stan. Stan would look at me, what'd he say? And I'd have to tell him. Then Stan would say something back to Russ, and Russ would go, what'd he say? And I'd have to tell him. And Mike, the manager, Stan's manager, was sitting there at the door, and I looked at him and just quietly said, you have to put up with this all the time. They couldn't hear me, and they were right there. He's like, yep, just laughing away. But here's these two old men talking about old times for an hour and a half, and I'm having to tell you know, loudly what each one said. Because they don't want to scream at each other. And we were in Stan's office. He could, he had money. We he, we could have steak and lobster or anything. But he loved hamburgers and vanilla shakes at the hamburger place across the street there in Beverly Hills. So we were sitting there eating hamburgers and vanilla shakes in Stan's office. But Stan was a real fun guy. Um, first time I met him by name, where he knew me, uh, I was standing in line to get an autograph for Joe Kubert. He bought this book and he did a drawing in it. They only made a hundred of them. And the guy with me, I were talking old artists. We walk up and Stan walks up and he looks at this guy and he looks at me and he goes, Hey, cause he didn't really know my name, but we'd met at the CCAC dinners and stuff. But he looks at this guy, he's a Walt and gives him a hug and they talk. And Walt's like, this is my buddy, Steve. And from that point on, Stan knew my name. Um, but, and then Stan walks away, and I'm like, Walt Simonson? And he's like, yeah, you've heard of me? And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, Beta Ray Bill is a huge thing for me. It's like, that's Walt Simonson. And then when we got into the line, Joe Kubert gets up, and he's like, Walt, what are you doing here? Gives Walt a big hug. I was in front of Walt. Walt introduces him to me. And he's like, why didn't you just walk here? He goes, I wanted to be a fan. I wanted to stand in line. So that's how I got to know Joe. And then I brought Joe out for the next – uh, Supercon in 96 at uh, uh, when we were still in Oakland. Um, but yeah, so Stan at that point, and I'd see Stan at Comic Con, he'd always stop and say hi. I was kind of sad about eight years ago. I stopped, he, he walked by my booth and he's like, Hey, Steve. And he walks up and shakes my hand. And there was this entourage of people. And this is when I felt sad for him. They literally grabbed him by the arm. We don't have time to stop. He was just stopping to say hi to a friend and they just took him, they took him away. Mm -hmm. and, and right then I'm like, okay, he's become too, too Stan Lee. He can't just walk the show and say hi to old friends. Cause when I saw him with Walt, he was alone just walking through the show. 
you know, this was in the mid nineties. Sure. Well, that's a little why I wanted you to share a more personal story uh, because everybody knows uh, Stanley, the famous guy, everybody knows Stanley, the pitch man, everybody, you know, uh, everyone has a personal, has their own relationship with Stan Lee. Uh, and, and I know that, 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 that is very genuine. He was, he was very genuine in that way, but, uh, a lot of us only know that version, only see the one that gets moved along and is in the panel. Right. And so, like I said, I thought it would be fun for, for some folks to get, something a little more personal. Um, um, so, which brings me kind of to my uh, other thing, and we're getting a little down to the time, but I wanted to talk a little bit about San Diego Comic-Con. Um, okay. Because you've been doing San Diego forever. It is- 1979 was my first year. Time. Uh, you and I would both be there uh, this week or next week if, uh, if it were a thing. Um, so, well, I almost don't know where to start. What is it like uh, being a vendor at San Diego Comic-Con? Um, and I don't know, share a couple cool Comic-Con stories for the folks. Well, I started in 79. Um, again, I, that was that key year for me. Uh, we helped sell Steve Englehart's comic collection back then. Um, that's one of the reasons we went down. Um, but... It was, I used to say it was my vacation every year and I got to make money on my vacation. And I remember I have met so many people, you know, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was a customer of ours. Nicholas Cage was a customer of ours. I mean, so many, John Singleton, you know, it was so much fun doing this show. And then I still enjoy it because I love the people when I go down there, even the Bay Area people, but it, it turned from, from fun to work over the last decade, but I still support it heavily. And a story I told you guys, it's gotten so big and everyone goes, it's not about the comics. Well, no, there are more comic dealers in San Diego than there are at any other show. People go, but, but it's just so big, they're over here, uh -huh. but there's still 75 comic dealers. You don't have 75 comic dealers at any other show. That's super true. Um, just vintage yeah. comic dealers. Um, but uh, so it's it's like I told you, I was talking with Justin Dada, the guy that runs San Diego Con, one of the guys that runs it. He runs the exhibitor room. And somebody was kind of, you know, bitching to him about, you know, how big it's gotten and out of control. And I stepped in and said, wait a second, you got to realize these guys, it's like a giant snowball going down the hill, and I told you guys this story, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Their job isn't to control where it goes. Their job is just to make sure everyone gets out of the way because yeah. it is what it is, and it does, they don't have control over it anymore. Um, you know, when Universal came in, they went, we'll let you have this, and we'll let you have two panels. Now Universal comes in and says, this is what you're going to give us because we're going to bring you X, Y, and Z from all these movies. And they go, okay, I guess that's what we're doing. So it's about controlling that. But having said that, there's so, I've had so much fun there. I'd say the AACC dinners were the most fun I ever had because anybody who's anybody in the silver bronze age was there. And I made so many friends like John Romita Jr. and uh, Tom Palmer and, and like I said, Al Williamson um jack davis i sponsored jack davis to be there and then he sat next to me and after that point we became friends um i mean just jack davis um the guests were the funnest part and the people every year i have this core of clientele that come and see me and one year mile high used to set up in a row now later they were against the wall but this was the last year they were in, in, a, in a row and they didn't want the final two booths. And I got one of those two booths. Per capita, that was almost the most I'd ever made there at a, sh at a, at a show. Everyone would cut, walk down and say, they want to see Mile High, but it's so expensive, they bought from me. <laughs> and uh, when my, then the next year, Mile High moved to the wall, and I kept that corner. Well, that corner has now become four booths. I have the whole row. You've seen what I have. Um, <laughs> And I really love the show. I love the people. The people that run it are really good people. Um, 
Faye, she's like one of the bosses there, was over at my booth last year taking pictures. And someone says, she's taking pictures because, you know, she's trying to find problems. I said, no, she's taking pictures because she's a fan. And then she came over and bought a Disney figurine from me. Actually, too. Um, had to send her assistant to come and get them because she couldn't carry them. Uh, but I love these people because I've been dealing – I've been dealing with these people before they were part of the show. Mm -hmm. And that's what helps. And uh, I won't tell who the vendor is. I had a vendor come up to my booth, not last year, the year before. And every year he bitches because I have this, I have the front four booths, this gold and silver section. And he doesn't, he's over against the wall next to the door and he wants my booth. And he's like, you know, well, you know, I don't have Spider-Man ones in a row on my wall because one, when I get a Spider-Man one or an X-Men 94 or whatever, I'm, I'm going to say this not to sound conceited, but it's true. I price stuff to sell it. And I, I price it. If I get it for a dollar and it's worth a thousand, I'll put 700 on it. You know, and someone will walk away going, oh, my God, I got it for 700. Yep. That's just how I deal. Um, and you've bought for me enough to see that. You know what I mean? Uh, well, this guy wanted what, every year bitches about my booth. He wants this booth. And finally, he brings Justin over and he's like, look, Justin, you saw my wall. He's got he had two action ones. He had I mean, stuff like that points at my wall. And he said, why? Sh why am I not here? Why am I stuck in the corner? And Justin finally told him and he was kind of he's like, look, I don't want to hear you bitching about this anymore. Because Steve's been here since 1979. You've been here since the 90s. If you bitch about it again, you will be in the back corner. <laughs> and it, I mean, right in front of me, he says this. And he goes, that's it. Done. This is Steve's booth. And then the guy walks away. I kind of cool and shook his hand because I was smiling. And he, Justin walks away. But, but it's true. I mean, uh, but I love my spot. And I've worked hard to get it. I grandfathered into it um they treat me really well they are really good people there and trying to control the crowds and everything i think for what they got they do very well i think I me and you have sat down at panels a couple times together the the quick draw um you know you've saved me a seat because that's the one i've gotten to see twice and that's it on panels for me i'm stuck in a booth um and the panels i mean there was three thousand people in that room but they could see well, they could hear well, they could enjoy the show. Everybody, if you were in the back row, you were still laughing and enjoying yourself. That's the thing. I mean, I think they do an extraordinary job. I really miss that today I should be, we started putting on a show the weekend before in LA. So just to kind of, for all those people who couldn't get into San Diego and we'd get the, the vintage comic dealers and art dealers together that are, starting Monday or have to, we all have to be there. Monday we would be there with our trucks unloading. Um, so they, a day early, so today's Saturday, so it would have been tomorrow is that show. I would be down there right now setting up that show, do that show, drive down to San Diego Monday. I drop my stuff off. I usually go to the zoo afterwards, take my sketchbook. I love to go to the zoo. I'm usually with one or two friends or if my wife's with me, but they kind of go do their own thing. I want to go sit with the elephants and the monkeys and the zebras and sketch, you know, and I don't do it. So people walk up, Ooh, that's a good drawing. Usually I try to find a corner. So they they don't do that. And I just enjoy myself. And that's my relaxation. Tuesday's set up. I could set up my booth in three hours, but I take a day and a half because I have this really bad problem. I talk too much. Um, <laughs> I talk to everybody that comes by. I, and, that's not true. I've never heard that about you, Steve. So I, but I enjoy San Diego. I'm going to miss it this year. I'm missing a lot of shows. Everything I do for a living isn't happening and it's starting to drive me wild. I should be working very hard putting on the next run of shows. But instead, I'm sitting here sometimes trying to figure out what to do. And like I told you, doing my taxes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's crazy that we're not doing this. Um, wear a mask, everybody. Let's get out of this. Um, but um, San Diego is, it will be missed this year. I'm sure it'll be back next year. I don't know in what capacity. I don't know if people are going to want, are going to be really ready to go out even a year from now. We just, everything, just play it by ear. You know, East yeah. Bay Comic Con, as of right now, it's planned. But I don't know if MouseCon in November can happen. My the odds are no. 
Um, the decision will be made at the end of this month with the, with the state guidelines. I think that's going to change because you see how crowded East Bay is and stuff. Yeah. I don't think people are going to be mentally ready to leave their house and go do this yet. I don't think um, I saw Tone Rodriguez is at a show today and I I'm, was watching him live and I'm like, Tone, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I need to make money. And that's the problem. A lot of these, you know, everybody's suffering. God knows I am. I've had to cancel four shows already. And not just that, WonderCon and San Diego are about 50% of my yearly income. Sure. And those two shows didn't happen, you know, because and, and it would have been good years because I, I did pick up a couple really nice collections. They're just sitting in boxes over there, just sitting there. Um, I showed you a few books earlier. Yeah, but uh, uh, <clears throat> let me turn that into a positive sales pitch uh, because I know you have tons of great books. I know there are folks who watch uh, these videos uh, that want to, that, that, as you say, aren't going to conventions uh, and, and they're a little pent up. Uh, so, so remind the folks at home how they can find your eBay store. Uh, My eBay so store is Moonball. I did an Instagram post showing a collection I bought. I'm new at it, so I haven't done too many. I need to start doing more. And this guy, Mike, who's a steady customer, a Bay Area guy, uh, wrote me and said, hey, Steve, you know, I'm looking for all these master kung fus. And there was a couple of uh, Micronauts. So I went into my stock, which isn't easy to get to because it's not like it's at a store on tables. It's stacked up. But I found him about 80% of the books he was looking for. And um, I guess, you know, it's Moonball. So it's like, that's the name of the, that's my store. It's Moonball Comics is the store on eBay. But you can always go to any of the websites like East Bay Comic Con. It's info at eastbaycomiccon.com. If you're ever got, if you got things you're looking for right now, I'm, I'm stocked with vintage um dc's you know early 60s stuff i just got an original owner collection it had a showcase 22 23 24 green lantern one up so i have a lot of that stuff i don't have a lot of the keys um i do have a uh hulk 181 right now but it's missing the coupon it's in really nice shape if it wasn't for that a lot um, of missing the coupon yeah <laughs> um but I, I so i have books and i have time if you, if people want to send me want lists, you know, you, I, I, I gotta say, you do a lot of the things. Uh, you and I work a lot the same way, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell this to the to the fans at home. We love the keys, we love all kinds of comics, all kinds of things. But, but you, you've already mentioned a couple of things and, and things I like to do with with my back wall too. First of all. Um, and again, I love the collectors. I love the anybody that wants to buy a comic book. That's why I'm in business. Uh, but but I, I'm here for the reader, for someone who likes to read comics. And oh, yeah. so it isn't all about the keys. Sometimes it's about filling a run. Sometimes it's about an artist. Sometimes it's just about seeing a cool cover and, and buying that book. Uh, so one That's how I collect. I, I collect yeah. by the covers. And that's, that's why I love coming to your booth at the shows. I love staring at your back wall. Again, don't get me wrong. I love the keys. I love looking at a back wall that's full of keys because you're like, yeah, that one. Uh, but I love a back wall that has books I haven't seen before. I love a back wall that has just awesome covers with great art, which brings me to the second point that you, that you talk about. And I do the same thing. And again, this isn't a pitch. It's just the way it is. You price them to move. Uh, they yeah. don't do you any good sitting on the back wall. They don't do the fan any good sitting on the back wall uh you want the guy to see the book to to think that's a great price and buy the book uh, right and and you know i want somebody to come in my store buy the book take it home and read it uh and and like i say i, I know you're you're of that same philosophy and that's that's a big reason why i like to well my back wall i'll i'll have a thousand dollar book in the box but have a thirty dollar book on the wall because it's cooler or it's something fun, you know, or it's, you know, it's, it might just be Micronauts 1, but that's so popular because the age that bought Micronauts 1 
are right now the guys really going to the shows. So I might put Micro S1 out there and go look at this cool Micro S1 because nobody's going to buy that $1,000 book. If the guy wants that $1,000 book, he's going to look in those boxes anyway. Right. But the walker by might see, like, you've got all these heroes for hire up there. I love that book. A lot of people didn't even know it existed in that form. You know, they, they knew the Power Man Iron Fist, but they didn't know about the earlier issues, things like that. So it's it's fun looking at wall. I don't want to see a wall. And there's one dealer in town who, when he does shows, he's got four and five of every key issue. One, he's too expensive. That's why he still has four or five of every key issue. Two, he's got the just, you could go and see those books everywhere. Put that Nova up there because Nova's cool. I mean, I'll put the Nova with Spider-Man and Nova up and sell that 50 times more than I would a Spider-Man one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I want, and, and that's the stuff I enjoy. And that's, that's, that was going to be where I wrapped it up is that just what you're saying is that ultimately at the end of the day, it's got to be fun for us too. You know, right. I've always put books back here that I love and, uh, and, and I sell all kinds of them. I don't know if I have up there one right now, but my personal favorite books and they're like $5 and people are like, you know, Oh, they, they think everything back here is a $500 book. And I'm like, no, that book is like $7. Uh, yeah. But but that's a, that's a awesome John Byrne FF. So you should totally buy that and read it and you'll love it. Because um, like I say, it, we all buy comics for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, it should be fun. It should be entertainment. It, it should be... Uh, it's you know, comic books for God's sake, you know? It's comic books for God's sake. <laughs> uh, that's, that's awesome. Steve, that brings us uh, to our hour. Uh, do you have any uh, any last thoughts, anything uh, you want to throw out there before I wrap it up? You know, I, I want to say thank you to you for, for always supporting the shows. I want to say thank you for any of the, the fans that are listening for always supporting the shows. We do this because we love it. Um, we always take suggestions. I mean, people go, get Stanley, get Jack Kirby, get, you know, they throw out the big names. Well, you're never going to see Norman Reedus at my show. Because Norman Reedus wants $150 in autograph, and East Bay Comic Con will not support that. That's why we'll have a John Wesley ship. You know what I mean? John's a great guy. He's actually a very good friend of mine. I've had dinner with him many times. That's why we got a John Wesley ship. Um, but you might, you'll, you'll never see Jim Lee. I love Jim. I could call him up, but in his position at DC, they don't want him to do that little show anymore. Um, plus, the line that I would get because I had Jim Lee is just too outrageous, but you'll still see Mike Royer and Larry Stroman and, you know, guys like that. I'm still going to have great artists there, but I just want to say thank you for supporting. I've spent literally 45 of my 56 years, 46 now of my 56 years in this industry working. And I couldn't think of anything better. And when I met my wife back in 1983, um, she walked in my house, saw me playing with a Dino the Dinosaur toy, and she didn't run. So I got somebody who supports me absolutely. This world has – most people I know have one best friend or two best friends. I have 20 or 30 people that I say, those are my best friends or that's my best friend. I count you and your wife as a group best friend. Um, but that I just love these people. And this world has been given me that ability. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I, I love this world. This is just an amazing world. If I, if I wanted to make money, I would have become a real estate agent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or I would have become a, a lawyer. I, I never uh, – let me finish this with my philosophy in life. And my father never agreed with me, unfortunately. He actually said to me two years before he passed away, and I was in my mid-40s. He said, when are you going to give up this comic book stuff and get a real job? He actually <laughs> said that to me. But – Life is about being happy. Yep. It's not about money. You do need money to, to pay your bills. Gotta Life eat. is not about money. And success, has a, your level of success should be happiness, not yeah. money. Totally and agree. having said that, this world has made me one of the most successful people I know. Couldn't agree more, sir. I agree with all of those points. Uh, I, uh, I, I dragged Francie to uh, WonderCon many years ago. And... Uh, when we left, I was telling her about San Diego and she was like, well, why don't we go check that out? I was like, I'm in love. <laughs> um, I'm in love. <laughs> said, you know, let's buy a comic store. I was like, I'm in love. 
Um, and like you say, it's, it's, it's happiness is, is the greatest gauge of success. And uh, more specifically, Absolutely. You your dad, one thing I like to say about my dad, I wake up every day wanting to come to work. Uh, and, and that's an experience most people aren't, uh, don't have. It's certainly not an experience my dad ever had ever one day in his life. Uh, no, my, he, my dad never, my dad was never happy. And that's the problem. Now my mom, my parents separated in 74. My mom always supported me. She never went, I'm going to buy you comics. I'm going to support, I'm going to buy, but she left me alone and let me do it. And when I go up and say, Hey mom, look at this. Awesome. She never said a bad thing. And before she passed away, I did get many. I'm very proud of the person you've become oh. and the way I've raised my kids and the way I've, you know, because my kids were raised in this world. My son lives with me now. He's 36 years old. Called me up. He was, he was working for John Dalman at System for System or Down for Torpedo Comics and just wasn't going anywhere. Called me up and said, Dad, can I move back home and work in the family business for a while? I mean, how... How amazing was that phone call? My heart just leapt when I got that phone call. I mean, I didn't say that to him, but, you know, it was just like, oh, my God, yes, you can. Well, and not only do you get all the benefit, you know, you're the dad, and that's that's got to feel all those things, but you also see that he's going to enjoy his professional life as you have, uh, and that's that's got to be a great thing to, to, to you know, to see happen, to, to pass on and whatnot. One thing I want to say before I let you go, Steve, you know, and this is another thing I talk about all the time. And again, I don't mean to knock anybody. It's a business. It's a job. It's an industry. We all work. Uh, but you give back to comics. Comics is a thing. And and people take from comics. There's, there's things to be taken from comics. Uh, I can take uh, fame. I can take money. I can take, uh, I can take all kinds of things. And, and, and but, but people don't give back, uh, don't always put back what they've taken. Uh, and, and I try to do that with free comic book day. I try and make people like me. Uh, I try and breed new fans, uh, by, by spending tons and tons of money on stuff I'm going to give away for free. Uh, you do it and I do it in, in many other ways too, but, but just to say, uh, I feel like an obligation to perpetuate this industry. Uh, it's not easy running a comic book store, but it's fun. Uh, and I want there to be comic stores, so I do it. Uh, and like I say, you give us all uh, a place to show up. You, you give us a place to meet artists. You give us a place to buy books. Uh, and it's a lot of work for you, and it's a lot of money for you. And, and, and all this is, oh, I just wanted to say that how much I appreciate uh, what you give back to comics. It's, it's, it's everybody uh, can, like I say, can, can do what they do and, and then all oh, that's great. Uh, but, but you go way and above and beyond what, what the vast majority of people in this industry do. And, and I, as a fan, truly appreciate it. So thank you for your time, your effort, uh, all those things that you do from me. Well, thank from you. Me I, 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 it, it's, it's our world. You have to, you have to make it, you know, one of my favorite things is when a little kid comes up and the dad will be like, well, give us something good to read. What do they start with? Well, I never charge them. I always give them something, but I usually give them a Gru comic book. <laughs> nice, nice. Usually, I'll, And at San Diego, I'll give them a Gru and then tell them where Sergio's sitting. Nice. Go get it signed and tell them, use my name, tell them I gave it to you. And then he'll have a conversation with the person and boom, they're hooked. And they're hooked. And, yeah. and it's it's... It, it, it feels good. I mean, I just found all these. Um, we have free comic days and we have a charity show here in Bakersfield, which was supposed to happen last month. Um, and, you know, we just I try to give back because it, this world has given so much to me. But sometimes I sit around and I look at all this stuff I've got and I'm like, damn, I don't deserve this. And that's why I had a conversation just on Facebook about somebody's like, I bought somebody, you know, a free meal because they're an emergency worker and, you know, they thank me so much. And I'm like, well, I do that all the time, but I do it anonymously. Not that I can afford it, but I guess a friend of mine, we were, uh, my partner in my comic store, we were walking out of Sizzler and a guy walked by and said, hey, you got any change? And I'm like, no. He reached in his pocket. He had a handful of change handed it to him and didn't even deviate from our conversation. And we stopped. I said, you know, he's just going to go buy some booze with that. And he goes, yeah, but what if he doesn't? What if that change in my pocket changed his life? He goes, the change in my pocket will never matter to me. 
And that changed my whole philosophy right there. Yep. Boom. About giving. And it's just been, a, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back when I give so much, but it makes me feel good. And I do most of it anonymously because I don't want the pat on the back. I want to feel good because I have so much. I have so much more than most people who have started exactly with me. And I thank God for it. And, you know, some people give me crap for that. I am a good Christian. I, I swear more than most people. I don't go to churches because I don't like how they run. And most of them just want money from you. But my dad was a Pentecostal minister. His dad was a Baptist preacher. That's how I was raised. But I do thank God for everything I got. And, and the big 27-inch computer I'm talking with, I could afford that at the time. Or a lot of people can't. So that's why I've just, it's given me so much. I mean, I live in Bakersfield, but I have a four bedroom house on a third of an acre in the best neighborhood that comic books have given me the ability to buy. That's so house, again, cat's house, be honest. What's that? I said, it's not your house. It's the cat's house. Be honest. Oh yeah. the 15 cats. And they were all born here. They're all fixed. Except for Mama, but she's finally not bringing any more kittens. We never were able to catch her, but she was born here too. Um, yeah, I do love my cats. I am out, honestly surprised. I keep a blanket here, and one or two of them stay here when I'm in here all the time. I'm surprised that in this talk, not one showed up. Maybe because I was talking so much. I usually don't talk. So um, my I do love my cats. Loud. And I never owned a cat before the age of 50 either. Oh, my. I'm a dog person. I have two dogs also. Well, Steve, I really appreciate you joining me. I really appreciate you sharing all your stories with us. Like I say, you're one of the great guys in comics. Uh, you're one of, you're certainly a local legend. I know a lot of the people watching, a lot of my customers know you, know your shows. Uh, I, I knew you would be chock full of great stories. Uh, again, it's Comic-Con time. So I wanted to bring in a guy who has a lot of uh, local show experience, big show experience, who knows everybody, uh, and you're that guy. So like I say, thanks for joining me. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for I having really me. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Everybody at home, uh, check out his eBay store. Buy lots of awesome comics. Uh, you'll be seeing some of his comics as we do our uh, Black Cat Classics uh, show in, in the ensuing weeks. Um, so like I say, I guess this about wraps us up, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Uh, folks at home, tune in uh, tomorrow uh, for Matchbox versus Hot Wheels. And uh, the last event for the pre-Comic-Con Comic-Con is the big sale. We'll have a big uh, sale section on the website at black-cat-comics.com. Uh, again, thanks for joining me, Steve. Uh, folks, tune in we'll do it again next week. Hope you all enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching. Steve, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Thanks for watching, everybody. Do I just...